with you, worship team. I lead you is to the throne of grace, with those wonderful songs and praises to the Lord. And our souls have been ministered to already, and I trust that will continue as we look into God's Word. You can have your Bibles. Would you turn with me to Revelation? That's right, Revelation. <laughs> At the end of the Bible. Last book, chapter 12. Chapter 12, Revelation, beginning to read in verse 10. <coughs> then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell on them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's look to the Lord before we look into his word. Father in heaven, we again give thanks to you. Oh, that our hearts and souls can praise you. We thank you. We thank you for our time together. Lord, as we look into your word now, with this passage, help us open the eyes of our heart that we may see beautiful things in your word, perhaps that we haven't before, that would only draw us closer to your Son. So guide us, minister to us, speak through me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, as we consider this passage, well, even the book of Revelation, your views on Revelation vary, and I understand that. Some consider it, uh, most of the book of Revelation, as uh, relating to the past, that it's already occurred. Some see it as being presently fulfilled, the prophecies, uh, currently through the church dispensation, and others, and I hold to the view that it's a futuristic time uh, yet, uh, yet to unfold, and uh, we don't know when, but uh, it will take place perhaps sooner than later. Nonetheless, every previous generation has said this is the generation that the Lord is coming back. And uh, so, nonetheless, uh, there are three views at least, past, present, and future view. But nonetheless, I trust that this morning... Uh, Irregardless of what view you hold to, we can all draw some uh, important application from the passage that we are considering here this morning. The book of Revelation offers uh, several contrasting, the opposites are so stark between uh, light and darkness, uh, between good and bad, God and Satan. And of course, there's even two different perspectives here in this passage that we were going to look at, and that's the heavenly perspective and the heavenly view and the earthly perspective and the difference between the two. And as well, another thing that's significant throughout the book of Revelation is the times and occurrences in which songs are offered up to God. And there's this heavenly perspective where we see uh, worship going on and taking place. And uh, one such passage, even though I titled the song of victory, well, I'm calling it a song because in verse 12 it says, therefore rejoice. A song of rejoicing. Certainly uh, words of rejoicing are offered and there's uh, songs throughout uh, this wonderful book, Revelation. There was a Wesleyan preacher in England, Peter Mackenzie. He was a most godly man. He was once preaching from the text, and they sang a new song. And he said, Yes, there will be singing in heaven. And when I get there, I want to have David with the harp, and Paul and Peter, and other saints gather around for a sing. And I will announce a hymn from the Wesleyan hymnal. 
Let us sing number 749. My God, my Father, why will I stray? But someone will say, that won't do. You are in heaven, Peter. There's no straying there. And I will say, yes, that's so. Let us sing number 651. <laughs> Though waves and storms go over my head, Though friends be gone and hopes be dead, but another saint will interrupt, Peter, you forgot, you're in heaven now. There are no storms here. Well, I will try again, number 536. Into a world of scoundrels, scoundrels sent. Peter, Peter, someone will say. We will put you out unless you stop giving out inappropriate hymns. I will ask, what can we say? And they will say, sing the new song. The Song of the Lamb. And so we see in this passage, there's three reasons why the saints could sing in heaven, but it's looking at what the saints went through on earth. Specifically, as we consider this passage, verse 11 in view, they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. I believe there are three reasons presented here in one verse, part A, part B, and part C, if this verse can be broken down uh, to three different sentences, and each one speaks of a reason why there is singing in heaven. And it begins with the first reason. There is the reason of Christ why they're singing. They have victory. They have overcome because of the blood of the Lamb. The question is, they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. Who did they triumph over is the question. Well, they triumphed over the one who was hurled to the earth and his angels with him, as it says in verse 9. And who is that? Well, it's the great dragon was hurled down in verse 9. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. We're in spiritual warfare. There are certain times, though, through the Bible where spiritual warfare, though it's recorded through the Bible, it seems to be magnified, emphasized at certain passages. Genesis 6 it talks about the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married them. Who are the sons of God? In Genesis 6 and verse 2, I believe they're actually fallen angels that took on the form of humanity. It's hard for us to understand, and I understand there are different views on who the sons of God are. But I believe that was the first step in Satan's desire to want to taint humanity so that the promised seed of woman would not come into the world. And that humanity would be tainted. And therefore God had to and be, uh, flood the earth and destroy it, except for eight who were delivered from it. Another time in which there seems to be uh, an emphasis on the spiritual warfare, though again it's recorded through the scriptures, but at the time of Christ and the coming of Christ into the world. How often do we read about Jesus casting out demons in, uh, through uh, his public ministry here on earth? It's mentioned, and of course, uh, through the New Testament, we've got Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 that talks, uh, tells, reminds us that we're in a spiritual warfare, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. And uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, it talks about uh, the devil is our adversary, or our enemy, and he is like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we notice uh, that, these, uh, that there's spiritual warfare today, but in the last days, as recorded in Revelation from a futuristic point of view, perspective, there seems to again be heightened spiritual warfare, satanic warfare. And that is who uh, they triumphed over uh, him. 
Him is the devil and his minions, or his fallen angels. And they have overcome by what? It says that they overcame uh, the enemy because they belong to a certain church. Because they had been baptized. Because they had a, a certain lineage and their ancestry. They were descendants of a certain type of people. It doesn't say any of those things. It says one thing. They triumphed over him, Satan, by what? The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. Only one way in which a person can triumph, be declared righteous, have the right to heaven, so to speak. And the ticket is through the blood of Christ. This reference also speaks, of course, the blood of Christ, his death, his burial, and resurrection. It's the work of Christ. And what we have here in these emblems before us, these symbols, uh, uh, the body and the blood of Christ. But there's no other way. It's the song, uh, it's the song of the believer to triumph over Satan. 1 Peter in chapter 1 and verse 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from your empty way, empty way of life, passed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or you. And John the Baptist would say, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Even though we... We know that it's the work of Christ. Here, it's the blood of Christ specifically mentioned. The blood of Christ. Why the blood of Christ? Well, throughout the scriptures, blood play, plays an important and key role as it uh, relates to atonement, as it relates to paying the price. In Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, it says this, The life of flesh is where? In the blood. It is our blood that's giving life to our body. And I, it, the life of flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for, soul, for the soul. So just as the life of flesh is in the blood, so the life of Christianity is in the life-giving blood of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ had to spill his perfect, pure, holy blood because our blood is tainted by sin. And so uh, it's because of his blood we are forgiven. And as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins from us. What a promise from the word of God. The victor's song. That we can be encouraged is not because of any works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy and grace, he has saved us. So it's correctly been observed that the next time Satan reminds you of your past, remember he's an accuser of the brethren. You remind him of his future. <clears throat> what does it say? He was hurled down here in this passage. He was hurled down. And what does Satan want to do? Because he knows his, once he's hurled down from heaven, it seems as though Satan, up to this point here in uh, Revelation, and currently Satan has access to the presence of God. And uh, we just need to read the book of Job where it seems as though Satan had access to the presence of God when the sons of God pre presented themselves. God, and Satan was also there. But at this point, at this juncture in the existence and the history of Satan, at, he is cast out of heaven. He is hurled down. So what does Satan want to do? He realizes his time is short, so he wants to cause as much havoc and fury as possible in attacking the people of God. And of course, the world. We need to be encouraged, though, that Satan has a future. He's cast out of heaven here. But in Revelation 20 and verse 3, it says that Satan was cast into the abyss. 
He was locked and sealed, and he was bound for a thousand years. Now, if you believe in the literal thousand years as presented in Revelation 20, mentioned six times in the first seven verses, that it's literal thousand years, as I do, at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed for a short while. And then in verse 12, 10 of chapter 20, it says, the devil was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the where the blast, uh, where the where the beast and the false prophet are, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever, and that's his future. So whenever Satan whispers into your ears about your past, and we all have a past, some things we, we wish we could forget, and yet Satan might whisper in our ears something may we may be confronting with something about our past uh, that may be a source of discouragement. Just be reminded that it's gone. It's forgotten with God. And we have a glorious future. Satan has a terrible future. And he is one day going to be relegated to a place of burning sulfur for eternity. May we be encouraged, not only about uh, this reason that it's because of what Christ has done, but also reason number two offered in verse 11 Victory, and by the word of their testimony. By the word of their, their testimony. We notice that the saints would not be silenced during this period of time. Yet future, but we can look back to the past history. Someone has said, uh, the blood of the martyrs is the strength of the church. And we see that, uh, or the seed of the church. We see that, here, these saints would not be silenced even though they were facing adversity of a significant degree. They proclaimed the Savior and the saving message. It says, by the word of their testimony, certainly we know that our lives are important, how we live, and people are looking at the Christian even today. But faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. And the... It, it was the spoken word. So we see here, there was, the second reason is a reason of confession. They confessed who they were. Whether it be publicly to masses, whether it be privately to individual, in what they said, perhaps in what they communicated, in what they weren't going to do, because they belonged to the Savior. In either case, there was a testimony. Their lives and their lips spoke volumes of who they were and whom they belonged to. May we be reminded. Uh, they possessed this message. They proclaimed it. The word speaks, it may be speaking of a personal word as they shared, but it could also be speaking ultimately about the word of God. The sword of the spirit most difficult of days, they were speaking God's word. The word of their testimony must inevitably speak about the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit that gives us a testimony. God's Spirit living inside of us, isn't it? For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, as it says in 2 Timothy 1.7, but gives us power, love, and discipline. And so that was their testimony. The spoken word, their testimony. To think that these saints of the future will not be silenced during the darkest days in the history of humanity reminds even believers today. And every preceding generation leading up to these times to declare who Jesus is and what he has done for us. The question is, do you have a testimony? Are you using your words to give a word of testimony? Isn't that uh, one way in which Satan, again, wants to discourage God's people and to silence them? To silence them from offering up a testimony whether it be publicly, whether it be personally, to encourage the word of testimony. 
So therefore, as we have opportunity, may we have a word in season. In the 1840s, John Getty left the pastorate of a church in Canada to take his wife and two small children to the South Sea Islands to begin a missionary work there. After a voyage of more than 20,000 miles, remember that's in 1840, uh, they arrived in New Hebrides Islands. The island chain was filled with cannibals and more than 20 crew members of a British ship had been killed and consumed just months before the Gettys arrived on the mission. <coughs> That's a nice welcome. <laughs> they faced the difficulty of learning the language. They, uh, they had no written form and the constant threat of being killed. Slowly at first, a few converts came and then soon many more received the gospel. Getty continued his ministry faithfully, including translating the entire Bible into the native language and planting 25 churches. For many of those years, Getty labored with little help and little word from home, but God was faithful to his servant. In the pulpit of the church, Getty pastored for so many years stands a plaque in his honor, which says, when he landed in 1846, there were no Christians here. And when he left in 1872, there were no heathen. A testimony. A testimony. The spoken word to communicate who Christ is. Remember, there will be a great revival during this terrible period of time. And God's people will be communicating the word. And so just a couple of chapters later, in chapter 14, we read of the 144,000 who will be going out and preaching and proclaiming. The word will be going out in spite of intense persecution. And finally, we get to the third reason why there's rejoicing in heaven. And that's the reason of choice. The reason of choice. Look at what it says in Part C of verse 11. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And unwilling conveys the idea of, uh, or shrinking conveys the idea of unwilling. This is speaking about the saints during the Great Tribulation who were martyred for their testimony. That's one of the continuing themes throughout Revelation too, is the persecution of the saints. In Revelation 6 and verse 9 it says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. In Revelation 20 and verse 4 it says, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. And so we see here, uh, these saints suffered, in one sense, the ultimate price. They were under great tribulation and suffer, suffering, yet they made a choice, a decision. It was volitional on their part. And what was it? They were not afraid of those who could only kill the body but could not kill the soul. They did not shrink from death. They concluded, the conclusion of the matter for them is their lives were not that important to them when threatened with death. Even though you and I may not be required to suffer a martyr's death, how do we view our temporal lives in the light of eternity? Do we have the attitude as the Apostle Paul declared, for me to live is Christ? And to die is gain? Or do we have the attitude, for me to live is gain, and to die is loss? For the believer, they knew that death was the ultimate victory. And may we be reminded, he may bid us to die for him. But until then, may we live for him. May that be the song of our heart as this year begins to live for Christ. 
to be encouraged that we're on the victor's side. It's a victory song. Uh, the reasons why we are victors, because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of testimony. The world cannot stop that word, nor can Satan. And finally, we approach this life with a view to the next life, and with the heart's desire to live for Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and grace. <coughs> Lord, there's many views concerning this book and how it's interpreted. Yet your people can all come to the conclusion that it's only by the blood of Christ that we are saved. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we're also reminded, O oh Lord, that you've given a song in our hearts, a word of testimony. And the Spirit of God, that is not a spirit that leads to fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. And Lord, ultimately, we don't know what these days and this year is going to occur in our lives, but you do. And we thank you that we have the promise of heaven and eternity to forever be with you. So help us, Lord, in these days and times to live in light of eternity values. We thank you that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself to us. I pray for each one here, that you would minister to the souls of each one, for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.